and welcome to the February 25th Stafford County School Board meeting. Ms. Hall, will you uh, take roll, please? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Chase. Here. Uh, Ms. Hazard. Here. Ms. Healy. Here. Ms. Hollerback. Here. Ms. Randall. Here. Dr. Warner. Here. And Ms. Young. I can. Chair, you have a quorum. Wonderful. This evening, we are joined by the North Stafford High School's Air Force JRTC. And they're going to present colors. Please stand. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, colors, colors, forward, march. Thank you. You all may be seated. I would first like to thank tonight's uh, members of our color guard, uh, Second Lieutenant Rivera, Captain Trueo, Captain Featherstone, and Captain Gavino, um, Gavano Collins. So um, it's always wonderful having our students here with us. Next, we're gonna move on to our approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Madam Chair, I would like to um, amend the agenda and um, add one addition um, for action this evening. Um, and that would be the letter that you have before you. I would like it to be added uh, for consideration to send over to the Board of Supervisors. Second. Moved and seconded. So uh, to approve the agenda to add an action item of 11.02 regarding the school board's request for um, to reinstate the joint schools working committee. Is that correct? Correct. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are uh, ready to rock and roll. We're ready to start off our evening with a wonderful special, special presentation from our friends at Hampton Oaks. I'm going to invite uh, Principal Hicks and his team to come forward. <laughs> While they're coming down, just so you know, we're going to rotate every month one of you, one of the schools representing your districts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair and school board members and Dr. Kisner. My name is Alan Hicks. I'm the fortunate principal of Hampton Oaks Elementary School. I am very excited to share some great things happening in our school community. First, I'd like to introduce some staff and students that are here tonight. Uh, Eddie Robles, he's in fifth grade in Miss Wright's class. Braylon Parrish is in second grade in Miss Nugent's class. Adriana Broadwaters in fourth grade in Miss Walker's class. Cole Cummings is in second grade in Miss Skidmore's class. Zoe Chick is in third grade in Miss Hernandez Flynn's class. I also have here assisting the students Miss Aaron Barker, the assistant principal. Miss Ashley Wright, fifth grade and new teacher of the year for Hampton Oaks. Miss Melissa Troutman, autism teacher. Miss Rachel Iero, autism teacher. 
and Ms. Janice Cook, our bookkeeper. At Hampton Oaks, we believe in strong minds, strong hearts, and strong effort. That is our motto. We believe all students can learn at a high level with high expectations. One thing I'm going to talk to you about this evening is our house system. We developed the house system three years ago as my, in, in my first year as principal. Why did we develop a house system? We developed it to build a strong community that has pride. And also, we wanted new students to our school to feel welcomed. When students enter our school, they get a t-shirt that represents our house, and they also get to ring our house bell and, and is welcomed by all the staff members. Three years ago, when I came in as principal at Hampton Oaks, I interviewed every single staff member in the summer before we started the school year, and I asked them, what are some important characteristics for character that you believe that we need in our school for us to achieve at a high level academically and socially? And that developed into our house system, our four pillars of our houses. And those houses are respect, red, integrity, green, kindness, blue, and relentless, orange. All fifth grade uh, great graders are then selected as leaders to lead house meetings every four and a half weeks. This gives every fifth grader the opportunity to develop leadership skills. They stand in front of their uh, peers and they talk about what we need to do to get better, but also what we're doing well as a school. The last two years, we have seen academic growth in all areas because of these high expectations. And the students have made each other accountable and themselves. Character traits is something that is very important to our school community. In 2019, we're recognized as a national promising practice school, and it's certainly hard work that continues every day. It's not something we just started at Hampton Oaks and we just finished. It's something that's going to continue long after I am principal there. Some things we do to establish character within our school and to get kids excited about being a Hampton Oaks Hawk is we have a house belt weekly, uh, student nominated weekly that is nominated by the teachers to, that develops a character trait. And in the mornings at the beginning of the week, we line up the halls and that student marches down to receive the, the Hawk belt. And Adriana was our Hawk belt winner this past week. So you can hold up the belt so everybody can see. Something we just started this year as well is called the Effort Box. I did not create this idea. This idea came from Virginia Tech. I was fortunate enough to play football for Mike Clark at Bridgewater College, which came from Virginia Tech. So we got an old school lunchbox, and we really talked to the kids about doing your best every day to, to the best of your ability. And the teachers nominate a student weekly, like the house belt, and they will receive the effort box. And in the effort box, they write down what effort means to them. At the end of the year, we frame that for it to put up in the school. The winner of the effort box uh, this past week was Cole Cummings. So Cole, can you hold up the effort box? We believe that after school activities not only engages children, but gets them to develop pride in the school community. And it gives them an opportunity to find something they enjoy about school. And we've noticed that more students in our school have gotten interested in after school activities are definitely our academic achievement has increased. Some of, the, some of the activities we have is we have our Sir Hawks, our Boys Club, our Girl Smarts, our Girls Club, National Elementary Honor Society, our Kindness Club, our G3 STEAM Club, our Garden Club, our Chess Club, our Girls That Can Code Club, our Tech Club, our Art Club, our Singing Hawks Club, our Flying Hawks Club, which are both music clubs, Soaring Hawks, which is Academics and Literacy and Math, Principals Reading Club, Intramurals Running Club, Staff of Food and Security and Business Partner Events, Autism Awareness Week and Parade, and many, many, many programs for military connected families. We believe all these things we do benefits our students. And I have several staff members I know that are in the audience today, and I just want to say that doesn't come from the principal, that comes from the staff itself. So they, develop, they, they, they get all those things running. So uh, when you see all those programs at Hampton Oaks, it's definitely community created. We've had the opportunity to share and talk about character at the St. Louis National Character Conference. We also got a chance to talk about um, at the Learning Forward Conference and the National Character Conference in D.C. 
We have the opportunity this summer to present at the uh, Virginia Association of Elementary School Principals how math and literacy combined in a character um, creates high academics for students. And we would like to say that finally, if you, if you look at the mural behind you, um, we had redistricting this past year, so we got a lot of new students in our building. So one thing we want to do is cre create something as a community together. Uh, so every student in our building, all 850 to 870, depending on the day, every student in our building, along with every staff member in our building, had the opportunity to create that from start to finish, and it took about two weeks. And the hawk is in the middle, and that is Whining Creek on the left and the Moncure Bear on the right. And Stronger Together, that's our hashtag, that we can work together and create a community that is uh, beneficial for everyone, um, not only um, at the school level, but as 17 elementary schools feed into all the middle schools and high schools, as well as teaching the students here at, at, in, in the county that we are trying to make our community a better place to be. And that's the passion I work on every day with our students, myself and staff, and it's hard work. We have our ups and downs, but we do our best and we're always a work in progress. I have a few things to present to you today. Um, so I'd like for the students to t take our board members a little gift to thank you for what you do for our, our schools every day. So there's a lot of things in there that has our motto on it and what we believe in at Hampton Oaks. Like to look out come on up, come, come on, on up. up. Come on don't, be, don't be scared. <laughs> I think for the rest of me, we switch seats. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Oh, you, you talked, you told what I was going to do. Oh. Any of the parents want to come closer to the pictures Wait on that. J J Melissa, not yet. So before I close, I have a little something for um, Dr. Kisner. Um, one thing our school works on is, is kindness. And uh, we've partnered with a, um, a person down in Richmond, Virginia, who created this movement. Um, you give a kindness sign. Um, you give it to someone that's special to you. I've been very fortunate to visit a lot of elementary schools in the state of Virginia where I take ideas from other great leaders. And I, I, I can't say I came up with this idea. but. Um, Dr. Kisner has been very supportive of me. He expects me to do the best every day. He has high expectations for me in a high level um, as a principal, and I appreciate that because I definitely want to be challenged and want to be better and, and do better at my craft every day. So um, I appreciate his honesty and his kindness as well. So we have a little something for Dr. Kisner to put in his office. Thank you very much for your time and letting us visit tonight. I appreciate it. And not only would I like to thank um, Hampton Oaks, um, the staff and the students that were here, I want to also thank the parents 
who came tonight to support your students because, you know, seeing you in the audience here cheering your student on is one of the most important things that you can do. I know you all have a wonderful and strong community, but I also want to thank you all for coming out tonight and sharing your students with us because it's wonderful for us to see what is going on in the schools. We hear it, but I got to tell you, it's really neat when we get to see it. So, again, thank you all for committing to coming this evening. So. Next, um, we're going to have a proclamation, and um, I'm going to take this one. I normally um, hand it out, but being on the Fine Arts Committee, I wanted to go ahead and, and take this one this evening. So I'm just going to read to us that it's a proclamation to designate March 2020 as Music in Our Schools Month, Youth Art Month, and Theater in Our Schools Month. Whereas arts education, dance, music, theater art, and visual art enriches the lives of countless people through arts programs in our schools and acknowledge the arts as a powerful tool to unlock the potential of the whole child. And whereas arts education is a critical component of the learning process and develops student creativity, communication, and critical thinking abilities. And whereas research indicates that students with more arts education have higher academic achievement across the curriculum. And whereas the importance of arts education is recognized as being necessary for the full development of all children. And whereas Music in Our Schools Month, Youth Art Month, and Theater in Our Schools Month are special opportunities for our community to engage in the ongoing process of arts education and bring a heightened awareness of the importance of arts in education. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the, Stafford board, that the School Board of Stafford County hereby designates March 2020 as Music in Our Schools Month, Youth Art Month, and Theater in Our Schools Month. The School Board takes this opportunity to urge all citizens to take an interest in and give full support to the unique contribution that quality school arts education programs provide for our children being adopted tonight. Do we have any music, art, or theater dance teachers here? If so, please stand. I know I see two of you. <laughs> Thank you all for the countless hours I know you invest in our children and make our, um, make our world a much more beautiful place. So next, we're going to have a staff report, uh, our accreditation report. I believe that's going to be presented by um, Ms. McCarthy and Mr. Zinger, or Mr. Zinger. <laughs> Come on down. Thank you. If you'll just give me a moment to wrestle sure. with technology here. <laughs> wrestle. <laughs> Let me say, oh, let me turn my. Well, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board, Dr. Kisner, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come here this evening and spend a few minutes discussing with you uh, the state of accreditation for Stafford County. Uh, I know for many of the members, we talked about this in May, so this will be a review. Uh, for our new members, uh, welcome to the board, um, and this may be new information for you. We'll talk briefly about the accreditation, uh, where we are and, and what the division overall looks like, and then we're going to talk about some very specific data. So just the background, we have a new accreditation system. We are currently in year three of that accreditation system. Um, it was in part a result of the change from no, learn, from no Child Left Behind to ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, some of the key features of the new accreditation system is that it, it includes additional growth factors in math and reading, which we did not previously have. Um, it reduced the number of verified credits uh, for, for students in high school who began ninth grade last year in the 2018-19 school year. It also reduced the testing requirements at the high school level, and it phased out our three portfolio-based alternative assessments. Uh, the VGLA, which was a Virginia grade-level assessment that was for students, was an alternative assessment for students at the elementary and middle school. The VSEP, which was the high school counterpart, uh, and VAP, which is the alternative assessment for our students with significant cognitive disabilities. The VGLA and VSEP are both gone at this point. Uh, the VAP we have this year and next year, um, and then there will be some follow-on program. We're not sure exactly what that will look like. So this table just summarizes the changes in the accreditation system. In the column to the right, um, as you can see, it 
it has both components of the old federal accountability system and the old Virginia accredit accreditation system. The three content areas that are part of the accreditation system are English, which is a combination of reading and writing assessments, math, and science. History is no longer part of the accreditation system, um, and so it is not officially reported by the state. We did retain the fixed benchmarks from the old accreditation system. So for reading and writing, that fixed benchmark is 75% pass rate. For math and science, that's a 70% pass rate. We added subgroups to the Virginia accreditation system. So we have an overall uh, accreditation, and then we have, for certain areas, we have subgroup ratings as well. There are currently eight subgroups. Um, next year, we will add a ninth subgroup, which is students who are identified as two or more uh, race, races. Um, the reason for that is once a state hits 15% of the population uh, that fits that demographic, then the state is required to add that as a subgroup. Um, we still are rated on current and three-year averages, and the school gets the benefit of whichever is best. Uh, the measures are both performance and participation. Uh, we are only rated on participation for math and reading. And then there are several other academic indicators, and I'll talk about those uh, in one of the following slides. Um, so for growth, we previously only had recovery. Um, we now have some additional growth factors that do calculate into the school's accreditation reading. And under the old system, both the division and the schools received an accreditation reading. Under the current, the new system, uh, we have only the, each individual school getting an accreditation. So these, these combined rate factors are the growth factors. The recovery um, is an effort by the state to, give, to recognize schools that have worked with students who previously failed the SOL and then passed this year. So if we have a student who failed in the previous grade level, the schools do remediation and the student passes then for that school's accreditation, that student counts as two passing students. The growth factors are also a recognition of in, increased student achievement. Um, in this case, it is students who failed the previous year, may have still failed, failed this year, but made significant progress towards passing their SOL, and so the school is given credit for that work as well. And then the final growth measure that was introduced was the L progress, and that's for our English learners, and it looks at their English learner assessment um, and recognizes achievement in, in making proficiency in English uh, 11 or in, in English language proficiency. So all of those factors are added to the actual pass rate uh, when the state calculates accreditation for each school. Uh, the reduced verified credit requirement uh, went into effect with our ninth graders last year. Previously, students on a standard diploma had to earn six verified credits. Uh, students on an advanced diploma had to earn nine. Um, that is now uh, five for regardless of diploma, and a verified credit, uh, the standard credits did not change, so the number of classes a student have to take and pass did not change, but what changed was the number of SOL tests that a student has to pass. Uh, with our younger students coming up under the new system, they have to pass one SOL in each of the five major content areas. Uh, one thing that uh, we have spent a lot of work on in the last couple years is the change to who tests at the high school. Uh, prior to the new accreditation system, every student at high school who was enrolled in an SOL class had to take that SOL regardless of if they needed it or not. Um, that is way far and, far and beyond what the federal government requires. And so the state relooked that a couple years ago, and now we only test students in the high school if they either need to take that test to meet the verified credit requirements to graduate, or if they need to take it to meet the federal testing requirements. The federal government requires that each student take the reading SOL, the biology SOL, and one math SOL while enrolled in grades nine through 12. That reduced the number of tests we gave at the high school last year by about 15%. We project that that uh, number will fall another 15% each this year and next year as the younger students come in with reduced requirements. That does not mean the amount of work to prepare for those tests has gone down by 15%. In fact, it's just the opposite. 
our folks in the high school spend way more time managing those students, going back and validating and verifying each student uh, when, and whether or not they need to take and should take that SOL. All right, on to the accreditation system. So it is a color-based system. There's three levels of performance. Um, level one is at or above the standard, and as I said earlier, for English, that's 75%. Uh, for math and science, that's 70% or higher. Schools get a yellow or near standard rating if they are above 65% but do not reach the, the green level. And then the school in that in an individual area would get a red rating or a below standard if they come in below 65%. So this infographic is a summary of where Stafford County stood last year for this year's current accreditation. As I said, the state doesn't officially publish a division level summary, so we created this locally based on the data uh, from the schools. And as you can see, generally we're doing pretty well, but there are some areas of concern and we'll talk about those. So I just want to explain what, how this infographic works. The top level is our performance level, and that's what each school is ultimately ranked on. The two areas in the red boxes are based only on overall students. So there's no subgroup calculation in those. Um, English, math, and science overall, and then the additional academic indicators. All schools are rated on chronic absenteeism. Only high schools are rated on dropout, graduation, index in the college career and civic readiness. The subgroups come into play when we talk about achievement gaps. There, we have eight subgroups um, and then those based on the results within each of those subgroups for English and, and math then the school receives an overall rating. Um, as you can see by the rules uh, school gets a green overall rating if no more than one group is in yellow. Once we get a subgroup that's in red or below that 65% threshold, then that overall rating for the school goes to level two. Um, and if, if that particular subgroup remains in yellow or red for four or more consecutive years, it automatically goes to red or below standard. Uh, the state provides us every year with a watch list, and that identifies those subgroups that have been on in red or yellow for two or more years. Now our accreditation system is only two years old, so nobody is in the, on the watch list beyond two years, but at, a, at the division level we would be on a watch list uh, for students with disabilities in both English and math. And then I just wanted to talk briefly about the additional criteria for high schools. As you can see, we're doing very well on dropout and graduation completer. This college career and civic readiness measure will not actually come into effect until for another year. Um, we are making great progress on that. Uh, we jumped about seven or eight percent from the previous year. Um, so I, I am confident that once that does become a, a factor that counts toward accreditation, our high schools will be in good shape. Can, can you just tell us what that is? So it's a measure of, of graduates, college, career, and civic readiness. It measures things like the number of students who complete CTE uh, testing that take IB, AP classes, the more rigorous thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a very long formula the state uses to calculate that. So we'll switch gears and now talk about assessments. So we're not talking, the, the rest of the slides will talk about assessment results, which don't include those growth factors. They, these are strictly the results of SOLs. So this is just a, a comparison of where we stand uh, at the division at each level compared to the state. And you can see uh, the Stafford County is shown in blue, the state is shown in orange, uh, we, are, we are right there with the state averages pretty much uh, in every area. There are a couple where we're doing quite better. Uh, there's a couple where we have some ground to make up. And this is based on, on last year's. Yeah, that's last year's results, Pam. 
Right, so this is the last school year, this is the current results, the most recent. And not on this slide. So you mean from the last two years results? I don't have that on this slide, but I can certainly provide that. Can I ask you just quickly, I don't know if this is appropriate or not. Um, so I, I'm just curious, I see that reading goes up from elementary to middle and then from middle to high. Is there a reason for why that happens? Uh, I, I can't, um, I can't really talk intelligently about that. Our office is not directly involved in the design or implementation of curriculum. I would, with your permission, I would refer that to Okay, I was to just Dr. curious Strike if it had to do office. with the number of English language learners or if it had to do with not being accustomed to being tested yet or, or just what was going on with that. So that was just a question. And then I noticed that writing from middle to high school, there's a big change there. Is every, everybody, is every student being tested for writing in high school and every student being tested for writing in middle school, or is that? Writing is only administered at 8th grade and 11th grade. Okay. Um, we, I know that the middle school folks and LOD are working hard on the writing issue. We have noticed that those scores are, are low in the 8th grade in particular, and I know that they've been uh, putting, putting in a lot of work uh, trying to f decide and figure out how that's happening and, and what we can do about it. Okay. I was just curious if you yep. had any speculation as to, you know, whether everybody was being tested. So it sounds like everybody is being tested in 8th grade and then again in 11th grade. Yes, so ma'am. So it isn't probably not due to that. Okay. Thank you. Well, okay, then move on. So we have a real strong initiative for writing across the curriculum, that writing is not just during English, that writing is at every subject area. So, um, you know, I would just share with you that when you just look at writing as an English activity, you're going to see scores like we have. Right. Yeah. Madam Chairman. So, what, what are we doing to improve that at all? Like, I'm, I, I know this is not positive, but big improvements. Uh, oh, no, I was going to ask you to talk to the microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> you're telling me, you're the one. I'll tell, yeah. I know, I'm supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah um, oh, what, what are we doing to make improvements in that area? Well, let him do it and we could talk. I mean, obviously, okay. yeah. we've, been, we've been having conversations. On, and I mean, again, you can look at our math, and one might say, well, we're doubling more than everyone else. Well, look at our math results. I mean, again, I don't want to, you're going to see the subgroup. We have a lot of subgroups scatter. Um, that needs to be looked at, but let this. Sure. Would you be fair to answer to Ms. Young's question? Because I asked you this question last week. In the last three years, how have our scores looked? Our, our scores have pretty much stayed with the Virginia average. In the last three years, we haven't seen any real movement. Uh, our scores have, have really flatlined uh, and are pretty, pretty consistent with what you see on this chart. If you go back and look at it for three years, it's going to look very similar. Uh, I'm sorry, then I'll stop. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's good just because it stays at the same level with Virginia. Virginia I, is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I agree. We, we're a very rich district. We ought to be doing much better. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd like to ask for a report, whether it be in writing or at another meeting, about what we've done this year to um, address the deficiencies here. In the, um, You've been doing it for in, a long time. Yeah. Well, this year in particular, you said that scores are flat, but if we're 64 and the state is 70, that's, what, 8 9% difference. And is, is that benchmark of 65 is in red, is that apply to this score or no? So if writing was, was a part of accreditation separately, yes, we would, the division okay. overall would be in red for writing. It is combined, writing and reading are combined together uh, for the English accreditation measure. Right, so we'd barely meet 70, but I, I would just like to get a report on that because this concerns me, you know, as a, as a school board member and, and also as a parent. Um, I think it's concerning all of get, us May right I finish, now? Mrs. Young, please? Um, I, 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 I know we must be doing something, but I just, would like to to get an idea of what that is and to make sure we can share that with the community and looking at the the math we're you know we're right on with the state and and we're talking about making some 
you know, significant change in the math curriculum in the middle school next year. So I would also like to, um, you know, have some type of report on, you know, how that uh, has been taken into consideration with the change we're making. I'm not asking for a, a response tonight, but and not not from you, but this is from the. Right. the and I just want to remind the Thank board you. that a year ago we came for a recommendation for a change, and we waited a year. So we're moving things forward, um, but this trend has been has been Stafford trend for a, f a few years. Um, so this, uh, you know, this, I would agree a lot with Mr. Zingle, we should be higher than this. Our, our demographics, our um, investment, we should have uh, stronger results. So we'll get you that report. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, just a quick question, Madam Chair. How long have we been utilizing a cross-disciplinary writing technique for teaching? Is that a relatively new introduction, or is it something that's been go ongoing? How long do we have any history of that to see how it's affecting? I think Dr. Strike levels? is coming up to answer that question. Thank you. Good evening. I keep standing up and sitting down with the questions that are coming. Um, so writing, we've started with writing, but the kickoff of interdisciplinary writing is part of what we're really making an effort with middle schools, okay? And in addition to that, we have a, a secondary initiative that kicked off as part of our professional learning this year. So we have the Northern Virginia Writing Project, which in 2017, there was a cohort here. So those teacher <coughs> leaders are now working in embedded ways with our other teachers. Does that help? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? All right. All right. So this is just a kind of a, a summary sheet that shows how our subgroups are doing in, in reading and math. And what immediately comes to light is that especially at the middle school level, we've got some problems with students with disabilities in reading. Um, we also have those problems with students with disabilities spread throughout the middle and high school as far as the ma math. Um, and so this chart just kind of summarizes and helps focus on uh, where we need to be moving forward uh, over the next few years as we talk about curriculum and learning. Um, I, I went to a, a presentation at the Virginia School Board Association year before last, and um, it's my understanding that this students with disabilities is, is an issue at pretty much just about every single school division in Virginia. Am there, I correct about that? I think every school division in Virginia and every school division in this country, it's it's, right. And, nobody and I mean, has I think, the answer I think what yet. They were, I think what they were presenting when they were talking about that was that the old accreditation system allowed divisions to kind of hide that. And when they pulled that out, suddenly every division in Virginia, except I think two, um, were having this issue. So not that that excuses our need to fix it, but it, I, I don't want people to think that this is just a Stafford thing. It's a, it's no, it's a, definitely not a Stafford. In fact, I believe the state just had a summit or is having a summit of all the divisions to talk about this very issue. Thank you. And if I could just add, I, I think this is piggybacking off of something Dr. Chase mentioned earlier about that college and career readiness. I'd really like to understand that number a little better, who that encompasses. And like I said, I don't need a long one, but that's another one that's straight across the, yeah. the board. So any of those yeah. sort of Certainly and definitely provide that information. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So on more information on the achievement gap, this is a reading. So the chart on the left shows uh, our reading scores over the last three years uh, by subgroup. And then the chart on the right shows last year's results broken down not only by subgroup but by grade level uh, and test. And I've highlighted the students with disability and English learners. And as you can see with the chart, um, those are the two subgroups where, we're, where we have st substantial struggles in English. If I, yes, could, if I could just comment on the English learners one, does that include, and I am not the expert, I'm looking at the experts out there, is that level one all the way through? When they say English learners, does that include 
everybody from level one to level okay, one. I, so I get the levels wrong. So. There, no, you, you are correct. So there's two accountability systems that is a little confusing. You have the federal and the state. The state gives you 11 semester exemption. So a student, if he or she is identified as English learners, for 11 months, 11 semesters, five and a half years, their scores are basically not counted. The federal, though, I think it's a year or two. It, or, it's, it's one continuous year in any U.S. school. One year. So sometimes it's confusing when you look at this, which one are you looking at, the federal or state? So you will see, although we're not seeing it in our school division, to be truthful, um, you do see in, in many school divisions that have a very high English learner population, when the kids get to the middle school, because they're identified at the early ages, their middle schools drop, results drop in that area. Um, but it is every level, <coughs> one to, to a level six, it's, it's every area that's included. Right, and for the state accreditation purposes, the students who are included <coughs> in this subgroup are all active L's who are in the program. And any former student who L's who were years one through four who passed the SLL. If they're a former L and they fail, they're not included in the subgroup. Um, and as uh, Dr. Kisner alluded, you will see there is a drop, a bit of a drop at grade six and seven, and that is part of because of the way the the eleven semesters is calculated. That eleven semester essentially includes all third and fourth grade L's because the end of fourth grade is the 10th semester for most kids. So this is, this is math, again, um, it, the same two subgroups or we're struggling with. Um, you will see on, when you look at the, co at the chart on the left, the map, all of the math seemed to do a U shape, and that's primarily because last year we had a new math standard. And that's pretty typical anytime we change standards on an SOL that there's a short dip, but most subgroups have recovered from that, that new standard. Um, it just takes teachers a while, students a while to figure out what those standards look like. Dr. Chase, did you have one on the prior slide? Or? Yeah, well, I was just curious. Um, you know, you kind of gave us um, an overall sort of Stafford compared to the state. Um, and and it's, it's just a curiosity for me uh, what are the state averages for the students with disabilities and the English learners? So I'm just, I, and I know you don't have it right now, but it's just curious what, how are we comparing with whatever the state average would be? And I don't know if the state provides that data or not, so. The, the data is certainly there, and as I was preparing for this, I went through the state federal data, uh, top to bottom, looking for those significant improvements. And essentially all the subgroups, all the overall, were, were within a couple points either way in most areas. There are, of course, some we do significantly better. There are some that we aren't doing as well as the state. But we're kind of online and, and really flat uh, in many cases. It's also, this is a good thing, but it, it's just got to put in context. 92% of the schools in Virginia are fully accredited. Right. So I say that because, you know, it's, you sometimes get a false reading on how you're doing. And secondly, the, based on a new system, is the next two years all our schools will be fully accredited? Yes. So under the new accreditation system, if a school achieves accreditation by meeting the accreditation requirements for three consecutive years, then that school is automatically accredited for the following three years regardless of results. And that's, so that's, a, that's a rolling measure. So, so I every, can't even tell yeah. you that from my evaluation, but, I'm, <laughs> but it's, just, <laughs> it's all because of me. But, it's, but that's why you want to see improvement. You don't really just, because right. we're going to be a credit. I can tell you that for the next two years. Right. Okay. So, so back to the math, I, I just wanted to point out, if you look at the bottom right column of this year's under Algebra 2, you'll see an asterisk. And that represents the fact that we had less than 30 L's enrolled in taking the Algebra II SOL this year, which, uh, you know, with, uh, with my boss, Roxana, we've discussed that. Uh, and that may point to some equity issues as far as access for those students to the higher, higher level courses, uh, something we are definitely looking at and, uh, you know, going to work hard on. And I wanted to close with, with the, the plus side. Um, not everything I said tonight was, was encouraging, but we do have a lot of areas that we're doing well. 
and so this is just kind of a list of those overall and subgroup where we are exceeding state and federal standards. Um, and as Dr. Kisner said, you know, our schools are, are all accredited. We all learned it last year, but um, we certainly can do better, I think. Are there any questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Madam Chairman, yes. I, I, I would just like to add to my request. Um, can we also get a report on what we've done this year and what we plan to do with the um, the English learners and the students with disabilities on here? I mean, these these concern me. I, I know we have successes, but if we are not meeting the needs of all the children, then we need to do something differently. So if I could, you know, just be assured that we have done things differently this year. Because these are the scores from last year's test, right? Right, of course. This yeah. is what we took last year. So in a few months, we'll be getting this year. So I'm That's hoping right. that this year's will look brighter. Yes, ma'am. We, we all hope that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it'll take a few years to get to where you want to be. I do want to recommend one of the things, school quality profile on the DOE website. If you go to that, you could drill down for any school you would like. So if you want more specific information. Is there any, do you have Anyone else? Um, I was just wondering if, um, thank you, Madam Chair, I was just wondering if we could get maybe um, an overview of how we assess our students with disabilities for their success. I'd like to kind of see how we do that. I'll note that on my list of to-dos. Ms. Hall keeps me, keeps me in line in line on our on our to-do list so thank you um, all right uh, thank you again for staff for the work that was put in on that report I think that is something that um, we know in the uh, future we're going to try and see that report a little earlier but um, I appreciate the work that went into that report next we're going to move on to citizen comments and um, Ms. Hollerbeck if you would read us in uh, individuals wishing to comment to the board may do so at this time. Speakers shall identify themselves by name, address, and organizational affiliation if the, spokes if the spokesperson represents an organization. Speakers shall also announce the purpose or topic of their comments. Three minutes shall be allotted to speakers. The chairperson reserves the right to restrict the total citizen comment received at any particular meeting to a predetermined maximum number of minutes with the approval of the board. Citizen comment, which is profane, abusive, or which threatens imminent physical harm, shall be ruled out of order by the chairperson. Although the board provides the opportunity for citizen comment, individuals desiring to register complaints against division employees or division programs, services, or activities may also utilize the procedures outlined in SCPS Policy 1113, Public Complaints. All right, I have um, four people who have signed up. Uh, if you did not get the chance to put your um, name on this piece of paper, you may still speak. Um, we'll just have you come up at the end. If you do choose to speak and have not already signed in, we're going to have you sign up to your left on the um, clipboard that will be to your left when you leave. So I'm going to call out the first four names. You can come up. You can come up in order or not. Uh, Julie Parham, Rachel O'Mara. Alan Watkins and Christian Peabody and anyone else who would like to speak feel free to go ahead and stand up and stand on the side so you may rush forward when you when it is your time to speak and thank you all for coming out tonight good evening board members and dr. Kisner my name is Julie Perrin and I live at 415 Decatur Road in the Griffiths Widewater District I teach at the Hampton Oaks Elementary School where we believe in strong hearts strong minds and strong effort I do want to thank you for the thoughtful care you've given to the budget this year and especially for your attention to not only the teacher salary schedule in general, but the prioritization of compensation for our senior teachers. After many years of being overlooked, it's refreshing to see the needs of our most loyal employees being attended to. So again, I thank you. As an elementary music teacher, however, I have some concern about the stipends earned by my elementary music colleagues. I'd like to know why what we do is so much less valuable than our middle school counterparts and even our elementary level SCA representatives. Before you say that that's not true, let's look at the numbers. My stipend is $515 per year. For that, I teach three weekly before school ensembles from September to April. I lead another group another morning a week from January to April and for four weeks, starting tomorrow actually, I have another group that meets, so I have five groups a week for the next month. 
for those keeping track, that's between two hours and 15 minutes and three hours and 40 minutes extra per week. In the next month, I'll be working two Saturdays, taking students to regional events, and one Saturday at the Fine Arts Festival. That doesn't take into consideration the other concerts and performances that I'm responsible for doing. Everything I do in regards to ensembles is before and after school. You propose to pay the SCA representatives, who sees a fraction of the students that I see, and meets once a month, nearly twice as much. My hardworking middle school colleagues who earn every dollar of their stipend get paid almost four times as much and their rehearsals are part of their school day. No, I don't direct my before school groups for the money. <coughs> I did it for free for many years. But the disparity in stipend amounts feels like an enormous slap in the face and an equal serving of disrespect. Your elementary music staff does amazing things with and for the students of Stafford County. Show them that you value them by making their stipends more equitable. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the school board, Dr. Kisner, I'm Rachel O'Mara. I live at 113 Basalt 22406. And it seems like we were just here last year having these same conversations about the budget. I am a nine-year veteran teacher currently at Hampton Oaks Elementary, where I fortunately have a good administration that cares about our kids and my coworkers, they are among the best. I have a master's degree in elementary education and I'm currently working on a second master's degree in psychology with a minor in behavior. I am, this year I teach 21 first grade students. They are the 21 of the brightest and best that Stafford County has to offer and they are more than students to me. They are an extended part of my family. This is what happens to you when you teach. The children we teach become a part of us. I work over weekends, holidays, breaks, and summer vacations. This is not only because I have to, it is because I want to. To exemplify excellence within my classroom, it takes a great deal of hard work and dedication, and I knew this coming into teaching. I will never stop doing what I do for children. This year, I have paid for my own classroom and student supplies to ensure that the education my students receive is engaging, academically solid, and enjoyable all at the same time. My students love to come to school, and so do I. I love teaching in Stafford County. Additionally, I am a single mother of the two most amazing men to ever walk the face of this earth, or so I think. <laughs> One is a 15-year-old and will be a junior next year at Colonial Forge, and the other is a 17-year-old senior. He will either head off to college next year or follow in his father's footsteps and join the Army. I have always wanted to give them the best life possible, as well as nurture their intellectual and emotional growth. I tell you all of this so that you know who I am and what I am about. I am a dedicated Stafford County teacher. Who knows that right up the road, I could change and increase the quality of life for my own family by $13,000 or more a year. Who are we kidding? I must be crazy to stay, right? Of course not. I love it here. My boys are Stafford County boys, and their teachers are outstanding, and I want to be a part of that legacy. So when you think about the budget this year, please give those of us with the dedication to excellence that Stafford County seeks out in your uh, forefront of your mind. We are here every day giving our all. Are you giving me, your educator, your Stafford County dedicated teacher, everything that you have? It's time to start and honor the commitment. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Kisner, Chairman Hazard, and members of the school board. I'm Al Watkins from 314 Hope Road, Colonial Forge High School, and I'm here this evening representing the SEA as their budget spokesperson. Great effort has definitely gone into the preparation of this year's budget, and the SEA applauds all those involved in its creation. There are so many absolute needs that are addressed, and it is the hope that those across the street understand those needs. In November of 2018, in preparation for our current fiscal year 20 budget, the SEA presented to the Finance and Budget Committee at that presentation as part of our 5% for all campaign, 
We also heralded a four-year teacher pay scale compression. We felt that such a plan would go a long, long way towards attracting and retaining teachers, helping them to make life decisions that would keep them right here in Stafford County. The model we presented, we knew, would have a profound fundamental impact. Our intent to compress the scale over time from 39 to 30 years was well received, but unfortunately it was deemed to be too costly to implement, especially in its first year. I am glad to say that school officials have partnered with the SEA, working together to tweak the current model that you have, improving it. After all, getting this compression model right is an absolute necessity. Though improvements have been made, the SEA still does have some concerns about the model, notably an inequality, a bump if you will, where teachers of less experience receive a more substantial pay raise than many more experienced teachers. Specifically, the very same teachers who received higher percentage raises due to market-based enhancements in the past benefit, where teachers who did not receive those are once again currently receiving smaller raises. Specifically, for example, a teacher reaching level 15 next year is slated to receive nearly $3,900. Uh, the teachers with more experience between levels 19 to 26 receive raises that hover between $2,800 to $3,000. The SEA looks forward to continue working together with school officials, specifically Mr. Fulmer, who has been a huge, huge help in alleviating this concern, working together on the pay scale, adjusting it as necessary. Once again, this budget is a wonderful budget that the SEA supports wholeheartedly. We look forward to advocating for all the financial support that our division needs. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. I like the red. Um, members of the board, Dr. Kisner. Um, just really quick, also, there's been some questions about if the lime stream went down or not. My name is Christian Peabody. I live at 121 Fred, uh, Forest Avenue in Fredericksburg. I'm the music teacher at Falmouth Elementary and the president of the Stafford Education Association. And tonight, the school board has the potential to vote on an amazing budget. And I know we all share that sentiment that this budget truly aims at launching our division back into the upper tiers of excellence throughout the Commonwealth's public education system. Dr. Kisner, the board and divisional staff are taking a bold lunge to get Stafford County Public Schools within striking distance of our Nova neighbors. And this budget is finally the proclamation that for all intents and purposes, we are a Nova district and a county and it's time our schools are funded likewise. And more importantly, this budget acknowledges the outstanding work that our division continues to deliver and the importance of doing what is needed to make sure that our schools, our educators, this board and our superintendent have exactly what is needed to continue advancing our collective mission. Putting it succinctly, this, this budget honors the commitment our educators and staff continue to show and will continue to deliver, and that delivery is nothing less than excellence for every single Stafford child and our community members. SEA is ready to hit the pavement again in partnership with the board to engage the community and secure this budget as much funding as possible. And following tonight's vote, um, please expect to hear again from our tremendous liaison programs we've secured um, thoroughly well-informed educators, passionate educators, to serve you on almost 24-7 basis as this budget continues. And Kara Burford, the SEA Vice President and the Director of that program, she's home with a sick child, so she couldn't be here tonight. She sends her apologies, but also she's very excited to get this program rolling with you. <clears throat> so please continue to reach out to the SEA so we can provide what support we can as this budget continues to advance and evolve. Um, we are here at your service. I'm here at your service. We are excited to re-engage. We're ready to lose a lot of hours of sleep with you as well on this. And we are really just really excited to really honor the commitment with this budget that you have before us. So again, thank you for anything. Please reach out for us for everything as well. Thank you, Dr. Kisner, for all your tremendous work. Thank you. Jeffrey Trigger, 518 Clint Lane, the George Washington District. Apparently I'm a lowly middle school English teacher. Uh, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. If you wanted to know what the county's doing, ask us. 
one of the things we did last year when it comes to writing is all the middle school teachers sat down and we looked at the curriculum and we composed what needs to improve. We mentioned writing. This nine weeks alone, I've done four essays. Four essays. We had to compose a thesis. We had to compose a draft. We had to compose a plan. We had to edit. We had to revise. We had to write sentences. Two years ago, the English teachers handed out papers for editing and complete sentence structure to every single teacher and paraeducator within our buildings. We are doing things to help our writing. Not only that, for the project that I collected this week, I came in on Saturday, on Saturday when the air conditioning and the heat was off and graded those projects. What are we doing? We're doing a lot. So pardon me if I, I seem a little angry because I am. We are doing a lot to help the writing. It's a lot of work. One of the things that we do have to consider the fact is we are dealing with students who are coming to us with you know less than uh, stellar English backgrounds. Maybe they're coming from a different country. Maybe they're coming from a family where English just isn't spoken as much. Maybe they're just coming from a place that doesn't value reading. And I can tell you right now, if you don't value reading, the writing will never improve. You have to actually force the value of reading. But I want to go back to the Saturday stuff. I show up on Saturdays. I show up on Sundays to fill out SPED reports, to fill out project grades to make sure students have every piece of paper they need to come in. Oh, well, I don't have this thing and I have to go into work so I can make sure that these kids have this, that, and the other and I email it off or print it off and make sure it's there in the morning for them the next day. We do need to support a budget that helps our teachers get there and do what they need to do. And it needs to be fair and equitable. And one of the things that we need to do is retain these educators. We've lost, what, 1,350 educators in the last three years? 1,350, and I can assure you a lot of them are math and English because we keep t being told time and time again we're terrible at what we do. And I'm telling you right now, it's getting exhausting. It's getting really exhausting being told that I'm terrible at what I do when time and time again my star scores are some of the best not only in the Commonwealth but in the entire country. I'm tired of being told that I'm not doing my job when every day I come in and I, and I bust my butt doing writing prompts from the planning stage to the final draft stage. I think that's about all I have to say. Don't, don't forget to sign in, Mr. Trigger. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Come on down. I'm Holly Ryan, live at 611 Peyton Drive, uh, 22405. Stafford's County mission statement is, quote, to inspire and empower all learners to thrive. Our values are learners, excellence, respect, and integrity. Do allowing cell phones in school align with this mission statement? A resounding no. Rather, they breed disrespect among students and between student and teacher and actively create the opposite of respect and integrity. Note the latest example is a TikTok video being shown, I won't say the words, but where boys sing to girls, B, I came to F you, I did not come to cuddle. Horrendous, but they look up and share with each other throughout the day. And they all do it too, even the quote, good kids. And this is what we're allowing in our schools. So let's fix this problem and uphold the written mission statement. Get rid of devices during school hours. Advocating for our children as school board members includes protecting them from bullying and cell phones are constantly being used as bullying devices. Also ensuring the most productive learning environment possible Cell phones thwart this by distracting students and their addictive need to look at them and making our teachers constantly police. We just were looking at some um, scores and those graphs. Maybe it's cell phones. 
I ask that you make a firm decision to have no cell phones during instructional period from 7.40 a.m. to 2.15 p.m. They can live without it. The very real data and statistics show how the mere presence of phones, even in backpacks, is hurting our children and blocking their full ability to learn. So how do we do this? Collect the phones at first block and put them in a teacher's locked drawer. Then students come and collect them at the end of fourth period. What a relief it will be for students, teachers, and administrators to not have to deal with all the problems that these phones create. It will be amazing. I've attached a copy of just a few of the school districts that have made this decision, and they are overwhelmingly pleased with the increased student engagement, better grades, lessening of teacher frustration with policing, overall happiness of students, and positive school environment. Let's make a change for the love of these children and teens. Sometimes we are called upon to do the hard thing, yet the right thing. So dig deep and let's free our kids to be kids and not slaves to their electronic devices. Thank you. Ms. Ryan, don't forget to sign in. I will. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Come on down. Don't be shy. Hi, I'm Laura Brewer. I'm Sherry Neal. And we are bus drivers for Stafford County. Um, since we had our town hall meeting last fall, we have never been so excited and have come together um, and formed a relationship with the board. And we are increasing our membership within the transportation department, our caucus. And we would like to invite you to our next meet and greet on March 3rd at Sam's on 610. We think it would be a good opportunity for you to come and interact with the drivers, get to know us, and hear the issues that we deal with. So, Free, free pizza? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that we have a good relationship going with the board now. We would like to continue that, mm -hmm. and we'd like to get to know the new board members. Great. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, George Schlegel, 35 Wincott Lane. Yeah, I didn't sign up again. Okay, right now in the VEA, we're doing something that we call a work harder initiative. We make a 30 second video about what we do to work harder and we ask our legislators to do the same. So at this point, I would like to ask all of you to do the same. Think about it, get back to us, let us know what you're doing to work harder for the students of Stafford County. A little video on the county page would be nice. 30 seconds. I know I had to edit mine like three times because 30 seconds was not enough time. So like I said, as a bus driver, we work hard every day. Then we go to our second and third jobs and we work harder there as well. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a good night. Thank you. All right, anybody else desiring to rush forward to speak? Okay, I don't see anybody. So at this point, I will um, then close public comment. Hold on, give me just a second to get caught up. <laughs> and then we're gonna move to our board committee reports. Uh, we will start first with our governance report. I will turn that to Ms. Randall. Okay, uh, we had our governance meeting on February 13th, and uh, during that governance meeting, I, um, I became uh, chairman and Irene became the vice chairman. Um, a couple, just wanna give a couple of highlights what we did. Uh, we went ahead, and it's on the information for this evening, is we went ahead and adopted a, a committee charter, <clears throat> which you guys can look over if you'd like, and uh, definitely don't mind any feedback. 
Um, the other thing that uh, came out, a big thing that came out of our meeting is that we are looking to improve ourselves as a board. Um, and by doing so, we would like to, it, in the short term, have an opportunity where we can do like a, a dinner and a Saturday training. And Ms. Hazard is looking into having someone come in and give us a little bit more of uh, what we want to do and where we want to go as a board. But then we would also like to open it up to a retreat, uh, possibly this summer, and where we can all uh, get ourselves in, sh in school board shape before the school year starts. So that's just a, a little briefing of our governance meeting. Thank you. Oh, we have a, uh, our next one this Wednesday, uh, March Fourth, yeah, six thirty. Thank you, Ms. Young. Finance and budget. Wow, uh -huh. and, and this is a joke. Two in one year. Awesome. <laughs> I like it already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the fab met uh, February nineteenth last week. Um, just going to keep it short because it's um, Chris is in the audience, so he could talk about anything. Um, we just talked about stipends. We talked about. Um, the projected cost, and uh, we had recommendations about scale enhancements. All right, and more to come. Yes. Correct. <laughs> yes. And our last one is our student discipline committee report. Ms. Egan, I mean Ms. Hollaback, can you read that in? I'm sorry. Old habits die hard. I know. On February 6, 2020, a committee of the school board met to consider one student disciplinary matter. The committee expelled student A from Stafford County Public Schools and did not offer the regional program to the student. Okay. Next, Dr. Kisner, you're up. Superintendent comments. Uh, first, I want to recognize Alan Watkins. Um, besides helping on the budget, I think I'm correct. I read it. You were the VEA Teacher of the Year. So, good job. Okay. All right, so um, to follow up on the March 3rd invitation, I would also like to invite you, we are hosting a breakfast for the bus drivers before their in-service on social, emotional, behavioral issues, and it's located where? Okay, so did you hear that? No, thank you, because I didn't hear it, North Stafford, okay. <laughs> All right, North Stafford, thank you. Eight o'clock, so if you're not able to make it for lunch, we'll send an email, okay. There's a lot of things I'm going to be inviting you to, but I want to get to some other issues. Oh, I'm detecting sarcasm. Okay. All right. So um, I want to know, I know everybody is uh, very um, sensitive and, and aware and learning about the coronavirus. I just want you to know that our school system is in uh, contact and been working with the health department and our nurses are... Are, are involved um, in keeping up with information. I know that um, CDC today came out with a new report or new uh, notice. So um, I will work with our staff and we'll probably post something on our website. Um, but we are following medical advice on, on the best approach. But I just want the community to know and the school board to know that we, um, at least for the last few weeks, have been in um, constant contact with the uh, health department. All right, some other things real quickly, and I will send everything in email, but I just, um, so for the fifth year in a row, uh, June 1st to June 4th, we're going to do Center for Responsive Schools. Um, that's focusing with elementary teachers. Um, it's in our budget, um, and so you'll get invited to that. Uh, June 9th and 10th, we're having an Equity and Social Emotional Institute, and we have some great speakers, um, about 500 staff members. We are inviting some of our neighboring school systems to send a team also. And will you, that is located, where? Colonial Forge. Colonial Forge, I'll get you everything right. Okay, um, this Saturday, if you're able, at North Stafford High School, they're um, having a special program on Black History Month. Um, and it's in a late afternoon and the evening. And um, I think uh, Cherie sent everyone a reminder on that, so if you're able to. I do want to thank uh, a lot of people, but I want to thank um, uh, our buildings and ground folks for North Stafford High School, our cafeteria people, the administration, <coughs> the teachers, and really the, the students also. They've, everybody has um, recognized when 
uh, power goes out, it has impact, but we're all in this together. And um, that school has been really, really strong in addressing this issue. And I want to thank Park Ridge because <coughs> they're now, usually high schools make it for elementary school, but elementary now is feeding like 1,700 high school kids. Um, let's see, do I have other great stuff to tell you? I do want to, I know last Saturday, many of you have went to visit different programs. That's pretty much a typical weekend in Stafford um, and a typical evening. There are so many programs going on. So I, I, I applaud um, the comments that are made about the weekends because you saw it. You know, we had a lot of teachers and administrators out this weekend and um, that's more typical than atypical. Anyway, things are going great, thank you. All right, next on our, up on our agenda are our consent items. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All right, motion to approve, two consent items. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to action items on 11.01, .01, approval of the school board's FY21 funding request. Um, Mr. Fulmer, I don't know if you need to come forward or if we would like to have um, a summary at all. For the audience. everybody pretty? For the audience. Yeah. We can. Short and sweet. Would, would there like to be a motion on the, on the floor or would we like Mr. Fulmer to go first? Mr. Chairman, I think, I think we need a motion before we have any discussion. Okay, okay. motion to approve the budget. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been... Uh, First and second uh, discussion, we'll have Mr. Fulmer maybe give us the, the big picture. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll, I'll try to give the, the high level overview. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start with the revenues first. So reflected in this budget is um, a little over $16.5 million in additional state funding. The county administrator presented his budget last week, which had a little over $4.1 million, which includes some additional funding for the public day school. Um, we also have an increase in miscellaneous funds and federal funding totaling over $400,000. On the expenditure side, at a cost of almost $6.6 .6 million, we have a 3% across the board minimum. Um, in addition to that, um, there are, is a teacher scale enhancement, which to condense the top of the scale and also tries to smooth out along the scale at a cost of $3 million in year one. We have $2.25 million um, set aside for the service scale enhancement, which um, first finishes the bring to minimum that we uh, started last year as like a phase one from the Evergreen uh, consultant report. Um, we have, and then beyond that, we are looking at 1% for every year of experience for the serv same service staff. So um, virtually all of our staff, excluding our teachers, would um, be evaluated on the service scale model for every year of experience. They would receive 1% above the minimum established, and that includes our paraprofessional skilled maintenance technology that were on our pay bands for four. We're moving them to the uniform scale that is equivalent to the pay band that they were already on and then applying that, the, the same logic. Uh, additionally, there are $1.25 million in new stipends, also adding uh, 130 new positions at a cost of $8.6 million. Um, a few reductions along in the um, non-compensation area as well, which um, are a savings of $1.1 million, some non-comp increases of roughly um, four, four and a half million dollars, which includes $500,000 for security, infrastructure, and um, 15 total buses in this budget, which is, a, I believe, an increase of uh, approximately five or six from the prior year. Okay, are there any um, questions for Mr. Fulmer or particular areas that board members would like to call out or comment on? No. All right. Hearing none, I would um, ask the board, as you can see, attached to 11.01, .01, there are two uh, proposed budget resolutions. The first one uh, includes some about our growth. Um, like I said, I, um, I, I will, I'll be honest, I'm in favor of us uh, passing the revised one, because just in case anybody who did not attend or listen to the county administrator, we, they have talked a lot about the continued population growth of, of at least 2% in Stafford County 
and Stafford County is designated as the second highest students per capita in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So that's just something to keep in mind um, as we go forward. We are a very family and student focused community and being second, I believe it is second to Loudoun, I believe, oh no, to Prince William. No, the second it to Loudoun is the fastest growing no, county, we, we, according we to the county administrator. Right. So we jumped over, um, over them. So I just would like to just um, note that, that a lot of what is um, the county administrator talked a lot about the budget he presented to his um, board was focused on growth. Ours is not only growth, it is our reaction to growth, but it is also to retain um, and recruit the best people to teach the students who seem to want to come here and are coming here. So, um, Ms. Hazard, if, just, if I might just, if, there's, if there are still two attached, we need to only approve the revised one unless you change the numbers in the original one. The original one was attached because that was from Friday. Okay. We Thank attached you. the revised one from today. I, so, um, so board just note that then the revised is the one with the correct numbers. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so uh, there's been a motion, first and second. All those in favor? Oh, Madam Chairman, um, at the work session, we discussed potentially requesting uh, the, the supervisors to permit us to make a, a, a maximum 15-minute presentation at their meeting on uh, March 3rd. Could we consider that as part of this uh, this motion, it, it, it's independent from the resolution, but it would be, um, you know, a request. And I would suggest that um, that it, there be a letter from you to the chairman of the board of supervisors and Dr. Kisner also communicate with the um, with the county administrator. And we would clearly have to do that, you know, tomorrow, yes. because yep. their meeting is next week. But if that's something that we I would um, want that. to um, yeah. consider, I support. Could we make that part of the motion? Said. Okay, to be added sure, to our we could add that. All and right. we, we, you just wanted to also add that um, not only do we want to retain uh, best and talented mm -hmm. teachers, but staff in general. Yeah. All right. So as the revised motion um, being part two of approving the budget and also requesting the ability to speak to the Board of Supervisors prior to their setting of the um, their setting of the advertised rate, the rate will not be set that evening, it is just for advertisement. If I may, Madam Chairman, it, I, I thought we discussed specifically making our budget presentation not to okay. exceed 15 minutes, so it would be um, sure. somewhat more formal than just speaking to them, sure. but it would be presenting you know, our budget. Because we are going to have the joint work session on the 10th, uh, but I think we understand that to be more of a, a work session um, than making a, a formal presentation, and, and I, we discussed it would be, um, you know, advantageous for um, us to be able to make that presentation and, and let the supervisors um, be able to review it, and then if they have any questions, they can, you know, get back um, through the county administrator to the superintendent before we actually have that work session on the 10th. Yes, okay. so as a presentation, if that's okay. Yes. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Our second action item, um, I appreciate you all adding this. We discussed this at the last board meeting about the um, desire of the school board to reactivate the joint schools working committee. A letter has been um, provided to everyone. I appreciate the input and we just thought we would like to make it um, that it was a board action because I believe it is, well, We'll find out. Um, so, if there is a motion, motion, motion to approve. approve. Motion. Second. second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know there is a first and second. I will let Ms. Hall sort that out. Um, they haven't uh, Any comments? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we will um, unanimously send over that request. We will move on to our information items. First information item, as you can see, um, 12.01, 2, and 3 all are um, related to the uh, actions recently taken by the Board of Supervisors. So I'm just bringing that to everyone's attention. 12.01 uh, is using the FY19 carry forward funds in the amount of 531,810 for the procurement of five mainstream buses. 
Madam Chair? I, I was going to say, could I make a motion? I, I noticed that staff asks us to move all three of these items to action. Would it be possible for me to move that we move 12.01, 12.02, 12.03 um, from information to action so they would become 1103, 1104, and 1105? I believe so. Um, right. I believe we can move them all do we, and then from a um, procurement standpoint, do we need to vote on them individually or can we vote them as a block? That's more. I think we're I think we're okay. I just, if you needed an individual vote, we can do it either way. All right, I believe that, yes. Um, so, and so was there a second to Dr. Chase's motion to move second. to action? All right, Ms. Hall, you can sort it out. <laughs> um, so What's going on, this is only to move 12.012 <laughs> and 3 to action. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, let's, um, I think we should go in order and do them individually since they are with different vendors. Yep. Uh, just maybe, I don't, if not, if it was overcautious, we'll change it in the future. But, all right, is there a motion? Anybody? A motion to approve 11.03. <laughs> Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Yes. Okay. Are there air conditioning on these buses? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. All right, oh, terrific. Goodness. All right. If hearing nothing, no, no others, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next. Next. <laughs> Motion to approve item 1203. Second. 1104. It got moved to 1104. I'm sorry, 1104. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> second. Um, first and, and second, are there any... Um, Comments on the retrofitting, <coughs> Madam Chairman. I'd like to um, to officially thank the supervisors for allowing us to do this. I think that there will be many students and bus drivers who will benefit from this uh, this summer, and I, I'm I'm really glad we're able to do this this evening. Yeah, and I was at uh, Conway's PTO meeting this past week. And I can tell you there were a lot of very happy parents at that meeting. I'm very grateful to the Board of Supervisors for allowing us to do this. All right. Hearing no other comments, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let's go last one. Motion approved. 1105? Uh, yes. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, procurement, go off and purchase. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we will be, I believe we will be at 12.01 when we have had, um, when it would refresh the approval of proposed revisions to policy 2103 student transfers. Um, Ms. Boatwright, maybe to come forward, or maybe. Madam Chair, school board members, uh, Dr. Kisner, um, the proposed changes to policy 2103, um, we had to look at this um, in accordance with the school board's directive um, to review it early in the 2019-20 uh, school year. Um, and, the pro and the proposed changes really allow existing staff the opportunity to know what to do with their students um, because existing staff who have kids on a transfer, right now the transfer form is not available to them because we had to review this um, at this time. All right, are there any questions for us? So, so yeah, for, for me, I, I, I absolutely appreciate the issue with respect to staff. Um, but this is asking us to, to modify what the definition, to, to go back to the um, designating a closed elementary school to 90%. And I guess what, I, what I'm lacking here is any data about transfers this year. So how many students have been, how many, how many transfers do we currently have for elementary and high school? Like, you know, that chart that we had last last time that shows the how many come in, how many go out, that kind of thing. And, and I'd, I'd like that information before I 
made this decision. So that, but that's just me. I mean, I. I okay, we can we can get you that. I know that we do have it. Um, oh, okay. Would you? I think. Does she have copies for Ms. all of us? Had. No. <laughs> okay. Miss. So, Ms. Healy? So, uh, oh, hold on. We'll, we'll go a second. Oh. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Healy. I'd, I'd like to say I, I really like this change that we're not going to make people apply every year. I mean, I assume if there's extenuating circumstances, it says it can be reviewed. Correct. But I think that's going to bring a lot of relief to families who, you know, have a child in school and, and also help in the staffing situation. I think that's well. very, very positive. Um, I do have a question, and, and I don't need an answer tonight, but it, it, it's somewhat along the line of Dr. Chase's um, question, and it has to do with the, the change from the percentage of program capacity to design capacity, because we have really, I thought, made a point that our schools are designed for a certain number of students, but that doesn't mean we can fit that number of students in because of the the, the programs that we have. And I understand program capacity will change every year. So so if that's something you can get back to us on, you know, what was the basis of that change? I'd just like to understand it in case I'm asked about it. Well, well, well we were using program capacity and we're changing it to design. Do I understand that we correctly? We were using design, I do believe, for yeah, middle and for, for high elementary. school. And you specifically said for, for the 19 For the elementary, it says program capacity, right? Well, for 1920, currently, we are using program capacity right. for elementary school. Right. So we're changing that to design capacity. Is that correct? That Sorry. I yes, in, in this proposal, and that's because we are still working on that pro program capacity and revising it. So we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves and, and put that at the policy right now. And then coming to you guys and trying to finalize that. We, so we presented the program capacity, there were questions we presented with the county staff and still kind of ironing out what that final program capacity would look like. So without that final number, uh, didn't feel comfortable with setting it as a program capacity and then setting it as a percentage of that and then having um, some uneasiness on what that number was and calculating the closed schools based on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can, I can see both ways. I just would be, a little concerned or maybe a little more than a little concerned if we're going to be making decisions on design capacity when we know that we cannot fit the design number of students into most of our schools because of you know special programs we have that that limit the you know the capacity of those classrooms so that that's all it's just no, no it, your point's well taken we, you're making the april of ninth, April of 2019, we brought this policy in front of you. To be consistent, we went with the definition we were using back in April of 2019, um, which was design capacity. Because so, um, I don't think there's really been a, some type of consensus moving forward if we're using program or design. There's no question based on Lionel's presentation we would say at the elementary level, at least, we want to do program capacity. At the middle and high school, we have been doing design capacity. Our desire really is that we have staff that are interested to know where their children are going to be, especially with transfer fairs and everything. So um, I wonder if there's a way we could still get you the information and get this thing to go forward. We're bringing it back because you asked us to bring it back. Okay. Um, so um, I'm coming from a different uh, perspective on this. I think last year I did ask questions about the transfers and I did see numbers. And uh, in lieu of our redistricting and now that it's settled, I would like to see where the students are, where they're coming from, and what the numbers are before. Um, we make the change. I see uh, words like it's disruptive for families. I'm not sure who these families are, but it says it creates uncertainty. I wonder why. I would like to know why. But I could understand the emotional uh, psychiatric reasons for, you know, the kids that are not needing to move and having to do that transfer. I understand that. But I do know that there are some preferred schools in the county all our schools are good schools. All our schools have excellent teachers. 
and I do know, uh, you know, developers and, and some individuals want to be in certain schools and they do transfers. So I would like to know to what extent, and if it's not there, then that's fine. But um, yeah, I, I would like just to see uh, what it entails. And I think that is it, yeah. So we can get you the um, numbers. The rationales were really referring to the annual requirement. Amen. So for instance, um, you had asked about the uncertainty. So if um, families who are on a transfer right now um, had to do another transfer form for next year, their child may not know, you know, to try out for school office if they're going to have to go back to their base school. So that's the type of uncertainty. Yeah, I do know also that um, last year we we did discuss it and we made, um, I guess, decisions. I can't remember everything, but that we were going to do something not every year for everyone. Uh, we did make some decisions. Like, there's certain ones that we didn't have to look at. Can I just say this respectfully, Board? Sure. You guys set policies. Administration has to execute. You should set the expectation and allow us to follow the expectation. There, we have 30,000 kids and 4,000 employees, okay? What we show you this year is not gonna apply to next year because we're gonna have, teachers are gonna leave, their kids are gonna be leaving, kids are gonna move up the grades, we're gonna have new requests. What, one of our intent is to try to, I don't wanna, I'm using the word simplify, but I'm not really sure if that's the term. This is an overwhelming process that shouldn't have to be overwhelming. We don't want schools to be overcrowded. We know class size reduction. We know the parameters set to keep classes at a certain level. So again, we'll, we'll bring it back, but please understand one of the things we're doing, I'm not gonna say selfishly, but it would be okay to say selfishly, is that we are trying to get a process in place that we can manage with a department of two. And it's really the problem of one. She's sitting back there, <laughs> Pat Jewish. So it's one person, and uh, I shared with you in my Friday email to you, we are not a school system. I know it's not popular to say, but I'm really proud to say it on one level, but not proud on the other level, to have a lot of staff to get tied into this. So, you know, that's all I'll say. If I, oh, go ahead, Dr. Chase. So um, I, 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 I'm appreciative of that, um, I guess, one of the things in this policy is saying that we aren't going to do this annually, and yet we have in in the policy it says that you know if a student is transferring for a particular program that that's allowed. But then what if they don't continue the program? And and the big example would be IB, where a student says that they're going to go to Mountain View or or Brook Point in order to do IB. And then once they've transferred to that school, two years later they're no longer doing the IB program. Um, and, and I have no idea if that's happening. I mean, that's just sort of well, so, it, it, it so does. what what happens in that case. And, and I wouldn't think that that it would be somebody at central office who would be on top of that. I would expect that it would be somebody at the school, their counselor or the principal who should be on top of that. Um, but I, I don't know. Madam Chair, I, yes. I think that's actually addressed. If you look at number four on um, I'm not sure what page this is. Yeah, whatever. N n number four, it says transfers shall be revoked if the reason the transfer was approved is no longer valid for any reason, including but not limited to not meeting requirements in any curriculum program, including IB, APPX, and, and IB is right. And, and so I'm, I'm perplexed at hearing that that's, not, that that's not happening. Well, I, I would respectfully disagree because I yep. checked and that is happening. Right. Sure. And that's the part I'm saying about the administration. You set the policy and expectation. If it's not happening, then you hold me accountable, okay? Because we did ask that question specifically about IB, and I was assured by those principals that those children are told they need to return to their home school uh, if they're not in either in Brook Point or uh, Mountain View. So, uh, you know, only thing I could say is a lot of examples, and we have a policy that you asked us to bring it back. We just went over this eight months ago, something like that. And um, we'll do what you want to do, but I'll just say those reports don't necessarily going to predict what's going to happen next year. If, if I could make a, a comment. Um, 
as I recall, when we as a board were um, considering and examining this policy, it was also in the midst of a redistricting mm -hmm. that we believed could be potentially unpopular. Well, redistricting, nobody stands up and waves a flag mm -hmm. and says, wow, that's exciting. Um, I believe that we did pass this and in order to potentially close loopholes that may have occurred whenever a redistricting mm -hmm. occurs. Um, I am sympathetic in hearing that the, you know, annual review, I think there is some, you know, it, it does appear that there is some burden. For us to have an idea of the volume of what that burden is may be helpful. That's, that's um, um, my, I would suggest, since it appears that the program and design capacity, I would be willing, or my suggestion would be, is we keep it at 90% for design capacity at middle school and high school, and if we can't move to a program capacity, take it to 85% of design capacity at elementary school, because it appeared that the design was much higher versus our program. I, I, I don't want to burden staff with that, but my suggestion, because when we were comparing those um, elementary single sheet pages, um, I don't know, in the last two or three weeks, or maybe it was more than that, there was a major difference between design and um, program. Understanding that program is going to be fluid, but I'm really not sure that 90% of um, design, anyway, I, I, I am willing to be open on that. We, we are more than willing to pivot to program. If you guys want to tell us this is what we want, program capacity, just say it. Uh, I mean, yeah. we're happy. We're just going back in April, which was not that long ago. We were using design capacity. So if we want to pivot to program capacity, that's what we'll do. Well, uh, my only comment had to be the change. I just was trying to understand why for the change. And I know we were being very conservative last year mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted to um, hold the line on uh, tr on transfers right. and I, I th actually I think that Hampton Oaks presentation tonight was great timing because that's a, one of the subjects of mm -hmm. you know controversy or you know yeah, angst and you know ha it's a happy place all our schools are are great so I'm I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting it be program over over design I just want to be comfortable that if we're going to be approving these and this is like a long term because it could be a six-year period for a, a kindergartner going in that we are comfortable in using whatever standard we set because I really like this idea um, not just for for staff sake but for for the families so that they don't have to worry about next year and and something on and so so I will you know I will certainly go with your recommendation but I was trying to understand why there was that change and this is you know in in the elementary level that's all yeah i'm i'm, I'm going to be supporting this mm -hmm. um because i think it really helps the the community and and this and the staff as well because we have quite a lot of transfers where people are moving their their children closer to the schools where they're um, assigned or work yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more in favor of program capacity than design capacity, and I would say I'd be more interested this year in going to 85% of program capacity, and then maybe the following year we could revisit whether it would be 90%, mm -hmm. but with the caveat that I agree with, mm -hmm. with uh, Ms. Healy that, um, you know, I, I would hate that, okay, we got to, it's going to be 86% because of who came in, and so now we're going to kick children out who've been there. I'm, I'm not interested in that, but I would like to keep the number um, a little bit lower. So are we going with 85% design or program for program. elementary? Program. program. Program, okay. Plus or minus, I mean, not hard. Stop and, uh, you know, I would agree with everyone that's here. But because we just went over, uh, we just went through a redistricting, I, the only reason why I want to see the numbers, I would like to see how we settle down. I just, because it's been a, been a minute before we're going to put this in place for years, right? Yeah, I, Permanently? I would be, uh, uh, I'm looking around, I don't know if anybody right. has it, but with the exception of certain schools we had very few families that even took the fifth grade grandfather mm -hmm. that's uh, i don't do you have those numbers pat or well, maybe carrie does 
Somebody had it one time. You can make it up. No one knows it. But no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, 85 is fine. Let's, let's. It looks like we had 565 elementary transfers. But that's just elementary. I guess we don't know how we do this. That's a few. Yeah. All right. Can I say it's, aggregate? It, it, it appears that the board would like some additional information for, for, um, for that. Um, and We can bring it back in two weeks if that's going to make you more yes. comfortable. Yes. I mean, okay. I think we yeah. can do that. If there are additional items, like I said, please limit you know, our request. This is still budget season for ours. But if there is something that really is cr critical for you to so on this. Back and then we didn't bring back what you wanted. Definitely not your mood. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that the main thing is um, I would even be interested in staff's recommendation from Mr. Um, from uh, Lionel and Mr. Anderson regarding the design capacity. I mean I think we've had a good discussion, but I would also you're the ones looking at those, so bring us your suggestion. Um, it appears that the. There is some request on understanding the number of transfers. Is that correct? Right. Yes. So okay. We have less. We have six hundred out of thirty thousand kids okay. have transfers. Okay. Of course, most of the elementary schools were closed for transfer last year too. Um, and that would be what my request. Funny, you were going to say that was under these um, criteria, which schools would be closed? Okay. Do. Is that helpful? Yeah. That All right. Great. And did you want the number of transfers we have by level? It would have to be for this school year. Yes. Yeah. I think that's okay. that, that can be run. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Sure thing. Okay. Thanks. Um, next, we have, uh, I guess, 12.02, approval of proposed revisions to Regulation 4706, Insurance and Retirement Plan. Hello, Ms. O'Brien. <laughs> Good evening. Um, primarily the changes proposed in this regulation are to accommodate for the pre-Labor Day start in the calendar. There were some things in the, the regulation that needed to be updated. And also with um, our new Munis payroll system, whereas in the past we required employees who were out on leave without pay for extended medical illnesses or insufficient funds, they had to pay us by a personal check for the premiums that were not able to be withheld from their from their paycheck for that month. Um, we can now postpone those basically and do an arrears when they get a check again, which is a service to those employees. But this this regulation just wasn't updated to reflect that. So this just seems to be in the best interest of everybody. Um, in two weeks, is that fine for us to? Yes, okay, that's can, fine. Can we put that on the consent agenda unless yes, anybody it, has any uh, it will issues? Be. With? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's see. The next one um, is approval of a multi-year service contract with waste management. Uh, oh. Let's do that one. Let's do that one first. Uh, that'll be 12.03, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, this is for our waste management uh, services. Let's see. I think it's going to be 12.03 now. All right, there is an existing for refuse disposal. Anybody have any questions about that? <coughs> Mr. Anderson. He's waited all evening to talk oh. about garbage. Come on. <laughs> I will tell you, though, it's getting more expensive. To it is yeah. very expensive. Uh, are they actually really recycling? Them? That's the big question. I found out they only recycle the top and not even the bottom. All right. Good evening. Mr. Andrew, anything to add or just? Um, we, um, we, the contract expired, so we need to renew it, and um, we're going with the lowest responsive bidder. Um, so this is what's um, needed, and um, we're evaluating our recycling program because of the changes that are happening around the country with recycling, and um, it would not affect this contract. It would affect um, how we implement the re recycling moving forward, which um, we would inform you about at that time. 
uh, Madam Chair, should we move it to action since it's expired? And do we need this back right now? It expired and we negotiated an extension. We would okay. love you to move it to action if you, as you see fit, but um, are also um, fine with coming back. Can we? Motion to move budgeted it. funds, correct. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, before we add it to action, may I make a comment? Um, I'd suggest you get some students involved in that, really good, in that recycling. They, our students have done amazing things um, on recycling. Yes. Actually, from the elementary up through the high school. So they may have a, you know, a new perspective to share with you. Yeah, I know there has been some student involvement, and, uh, but we would like to increase that if we can. Yeah. My, 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 I would like to know what is being recycled because there's not, not, not the, after the budget season, please. <laughs> but from what I understand is that, the, well, from, school I know, right? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you're being, you're on candid camera. Um, from what I understand, only the cover of a plastic bottles from one is, is, is useful. And so, what are, what are we doing? You um, know? We, when we evaluate the program, we can come back with more information. Yeah. I know we're trying to keep it simple. Sure. And we're trying to focus on quality because when the recycling is contaminated, it um, sure. really causes more waste. Yep. And um, so we're going to be looking at that in a lot of detail. Certainly. Thanks, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Because the contract is expired, I make a motion to move this to action item. What would it be? 1106, I think. 1103, I think. Or is it 1203? Huh? What is it? Second. All right. All right. It's been moved and seconded. This is to move it to action. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Good night, Mr. Anderson. Is there a follow on motion? Uh, motion to approve action 1106. Second. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. All right, that moving on to <laughs> approval of um, Governance Committee Charter, which is now number 12 point something. Move to approve. Oh, well, this is just information. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, I'm just and I actually had a, a couple yeah. of comments. Sure, so, sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, the, the two comments I had, one had to do with the requirement that the chair or vice chair be on the committee, and I would probably not want to have that as a requirement, just knowing how many things that chairs and vice chairs end up having to do that I'd, I'd hate to, to have that be written in stone, so to speak. Um, and then my second thing was I wasn't quite sure what was meant by coordinating the establishment of goals and measurements for the superintendent's annual performance evaluations. Um, and so maybe, I don't know if it's a wording thing or just what, but I, I know that is considered the, one of the primary responsibilities of the entire school board. And so the, the wording just gave me a little pause that I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, give that role to just a subset of the board. So th that, that was my second comment. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> make sure I'm in the right spot. Um, why don't, uh, Ms. Randall, why don't you look those over and okay. then bring back suggested changes or um, even reply. Well, and that's even, just me. I'm just one yeah, member no, of the and board. I, so I, I, and I'll just say that um, when I was researching different charters and that sort of thing, it did come up to go ahead and use um, a ch the chair. Most of them actually were saying chair and vice chair. Uh, it happens to be the case this time. But um, I think they were just trying to make sure that as with the superintendent there that maybe there was communication with him about you know, guidance, leadership, governance, that sort of thing. So that was that was the reason I suggested that. It was something that I had seen repeat, repeated. And then um, as far as the superintendent coordinating the establishment of goals and measurements, it would just be, I think, more or less um, coordinating it would be the of bringing it to the board of thoughts and ideas. What do you have as a thought and idea that we can make sure that we get it done on a time schedule? Which so maybe scheduling rather than coordinating? Sure. I mean, just yeah. to, just to, to yeah. make it just a little clearer. Just to make sure that, that we stay on target for what we're supposed to do, sure. which I know was an issue before. Okay. We will. Um, I have, oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have, thank you, Madam Chair. I have just one question. Um, 
You talk about um, developing and recommending to the school board the number and structure of committees to be created by the board. It just seems number seems kind of a vague description. I'm wondering if creation and dissolution of committees and might be a more specific way of explaining that. Sure. Ms. Yeah. All right. The reworked, new and improved, whatever version we'll call it, will be appearing um, on an agenda near you in two weeks. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, final uh, item is the discussion of the process and timing for any proposed changes to the student cell phone use policy for the 2021 school year. I'm going to just do an opening on it, then I am going to um, to send it over to Dr. Kisner. Um, one of the things that we have heard and I have discussed with other, um, with various board members is going to almost what we were just talking there is timing. Be making sure that we can back from when we want to have something approved, making sure we have sufficient discussion and input, that then there isn't all of a sudden a vote to have to do something without sufficient. And so I felt that this was important for us to go ahead and sort of talk about an agreed timeline that the board is comfortable with with regard to this going forward, sort of with our, what I would call, d future dates so that we can be approved or discussed in an open forum in front of, um, in with the community's um, input? input in the best fashion possible. So that's, so now I will turn it over to Dr. Kisser. <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, Take it very seriously the comments that the school board has been making the last few months and also looking at two models that we actually have in place Brook Point and Stafford Middle School they're somewhat different Brook Point as you're aware of allows the children to bring the cell phones into the building and use it except for classrooms I happen to be at Brook Point today in room 116 um, the reason I mentioned it, I, I wish I could remember the teacher's name. And I was very pleased to see how the kids went up there and put their phone right away in the, uh, I'll just call it a shoe drop area. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, why I believe that school is working is because that did not come from a superintendent or school board. Okay. It came from discussions with the staff, discussions with parents, and truthfully, discussions with students, but there's been a, really interesting change with the students because I had breakfast with them months ago when it was first initiated and they wanted me to fire everybody, okay? <laughs> and today I talk to the students and, and they're fine with it. They actually, they see a lot of positives not having it on in the classrooms. I didn't even realize Stafford Middle School did what I'm about to share is at my superintendent advisory committee, I brought this topic up with teachers, and the conversations that you guys had the you know, last couple of weeks is pretty similar to what you're going to hear when you get a lot of adults in a room. And, but the, what Stafford Middle School, the teacher rep on that committee, on my committee, stated that there's an expectation as soon as the kids walk into the building, there's no cell phones. And, and she says it's actually good because kids talk to each other in the hallway, they talk to each other in a lunchroom. Okay, I didn't ask the other middle schools if that's what they're doing, but I can at least speak for staff at middle school. So how did we leave it? We met with the principals and asked them by April 1st to work with their stakeholders, parents and staff, and if appropriate, applicable students, which I think they should, and then report to the three chiefs, two of them are here, uh, what, they, what they believe their school community feels is in the best interest and I honestly think commitment over compliance is going to be a stronger end result. Brook Point did not feel like that your policy was wrong. They could work in the parameters of your school board policy. Um, so I would just offer that uh, the first meeting in April, I will present to you what the buildings have stated. And then you'll, and I like the idea that not everybody's gonna come back with the same thing. But there was an expectation that during the school time, during the instructional time, the cell phones would not be on. Now, I did, just so you know, some of the discussion. Some of the teachers said, well, we like to use it as a reinforcer. If the kid has, you know, five minutes left in the class, did their work, they could use it. So if the school board wanted to set an expectation, 
that know during the instructional time, all 90 minutes or 60 minutes, whatever the period is, that cell phone is not used, that would be something that the school, the staff would have to work around that. But I guess what I'm really sharing with you is, I'm so congested, I don't know if you can hear me. I can't yes, hear we me. can. Okay, okay. <laughs> Very much so. It pains um, me. So I guess I'm sharing is that I believe we're on the right path in letting the administrators work with their staff and parents, and they were given an April 1st a timeline, and then soon afterwards at our board meeting, we can present that to you. That would be April 14th. April 13th, meeting. perfect. 14th. 14th, that's even better. Uh, Chairwoman. <laughs> <laughs> Chairwoman yes. Hazard, I, yeah, I have. Oh, wait, hold on, then yeah. I'll get there. Yeah, Sorry. so uh, I know you scolded me the last time when I told you that Brook Point was a pilot, and uh, it, 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 it. No, Brook Point is a pilot, but um, I, 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 I like what you said, and but one of the things I'm concerned about um, is that we do need to set a standard, and that cell phone um, is a phone, it's a smartphone. Um, if we have technology where we have um, laptops or Macs or whatever for instructional, that's what we should be using um, and not the cell phone. Um, so that, that is my thought process, that all the phones should be gone um, in the little shoebox, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we should have Macs or laptops or uh, pads for the kids, not cell phones. Madam Chair, may I? Yes, So one of the things, I had a conversation with um, uh, a couple of teachers, and one of the things that I was hearing from them is they kind of did like their own science experiment, if you will. And they um, took, you know, gave the strict policy, no cell phones. And any kid, of course, that w was defiant of that was handled, which becomes an, a, a really monumental discipline issue for some of the teachers. But what they also did in another experiment in another classroom, same school, um, they coordinated this, was they did an experiment where they told the students that um, if you put your cell phones away and I will give you the last five, ten minutes. And they found that when the kids were given something that there was a much more um, there was much more effort on their part to be compliant with the rules, which meant less policing by the teacher. Because if you keep your phones away, the phones can come out. If you don't keep your phones away, they don't come out. So it was uh, it was just an interesting conversation that I had with a few teachers. My parent advisory committee, so we have one very passionate parent has come a couple times, and I respect that. We gave out her first article to the principals. I would just tell you, parents have different opinions on this also, okay? And staff will. You know, I've heard some staff say, you know, the hallways are quieter because the kids are plugged in. You know, I'm not sure if that's healthy or not, but I don't want, I truthfully don't want my principals nor teachers to be cell phone cops, okay? And I do think they should work with their student, uh, with their uh, stakeholders, and come to an agreement what, what everything could be, could be supported. However, it would not be um, out of your realm or unrealistic if the school board wanted to make a statement. And I, and I guess your last example suggests maybe this is not something that at least maybe you want to do based on your feedback, is to say during the instructional time, I agree with you, I don't see the cell phone being used for instructional purposes, but as Mr. Uh, Tigger, uh, I can't, Jeff reminded us, Maybe there's going to there'll be a couple teachers that will tell us it is used for instructional purposes. So I don't want to take that leap because I don't you know every teacher might handle it differently. I'm just suggesting let's see what comes back, mm -hmm. and and then what comes back might be things that we didn't even think about that you didn't think about. Um, I would at least say at the Brook Point level they did not feel that your policy was a concern. It was how they implemented the policy. So that's what I'm suggesting for policy wise. You may not have a, a reason to change it. You may after you get the feedback from others. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I do want to say something about using the cell phone as a reinforcer. Um, that that does give me a little bit of a pause as as somebody who does know a little bit about uh, operant conditioning, um, because when we use it as a reward, it may become more of a reward, and it may become. Uh, 
gain more power than we want it to gain. So I, I'm a little concerned about that. Um, but I am perfectly amenable to seeing what staff comes back with. Um, and uh, I've, you know, the cell phones was one of the things we chatted about at Conway, and, and I found most of the parents were actually, and of course they're elementary school parents, although some of them have older kids. Um, one of them had a child at a school where they actually have lock boxes. Um, so when you come in for the morning, you put your phone in the lock box, you've got your little number, um, and then at the end of the day, you collect your phone. Um, and I don't know that that's logistically possible. Um, so I'll be interested to see what ideas or suggestions come up. But um, I do think it's important that, that our students aren't being distracted from, from learning. I have a, I have a question, um, Dr. Kisner. If I remember correctly, the policy that was passed back, when was it, four years ago? That it didn't include elementary schools. I, I believe elementary schools are not to have cell phones. I'm, I'm not aware of elementary schools raising an issue that kids are having cell phones. So, um, so I think that's, that's being followed. Okay. Um, the elementary, uh, the real conversation has been with middle and high school, to be truthful with you. But I will tell you this, and I'm not going to say it happens often. There are periodic times where I see an elementary kid getting into his mother and father's car or on the bus and a cell phone so seems to appear. And I think that might be more for child care supervision issues. Um, it doesn't happen often. Uh, I would just be interested to, uh, maybe Ms. Boatwright can pull the uh, code of conduct as. I think you're I, right. I'm just curious, because I, 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 my, recollection, my recollection is is that cell phones were not permitted in elementary I, I, school. I'm pretty sure I read the policy recently, right. and I'm pretty sure you're correct. I, I think it said, didn't it say they had to be in their backpacks? I think that's what it said. They can, if they have them, they have to be in their backpacks. They yeah, maybe that's be what out. I said. I, sure. But I'm remembering back four years. So. so, again, this was to make sure that the board, that we have sort of a path forward of when we're going to be receiving the information, because I know it is some, something. So, um, come April 14th or so, we will be getting that. Part of also putting it on for tonight is for those who have interest in this topic, make sure you are you know, certainly reaching out to board members, but also reach out to the school um, administration of where your students go, because that is it's also a great a place for you to be able to. Um, <laughs> um, I, I just have one comment, Dr. Kisner. Um, do the, it's a dumb question, do the principals and teachers already know that this is a policy? Do all of them know that we're trying to? No our current policy? Is that the question? Not even the kind that we're trying to, yeah, implement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, that. there's been discussion at the principal's level. I've surely, surely have talked about it at the superintendent advisory committee right. level. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because emails are going to start flying again. I, I, I don't think there's really sure. disagreement that we got to do something. I'm not hearing anybody say, we love mm -hmm. the way we're doing it now. I'm not hearing anybody. It's where, what is the next step is what I'm hearing more of. Yeah. All right. Well, um, enough for this evening on, on the cell phones. I tried. Um, please, uh, board members, um, remember the budget tonight passing it was step one. The next part is going to be moving into um, advocacy mode. Please make sure that um, you are meeting with your counterparts, but also with the public about this meeting. Remember, we will be having the next regular board meeting for the school board is going to be March 10th. However, we um, I applaud those that will be there tomorrow um, liaising with the Board of Supervisors and possibly keep, of course, March 3rd on your schedule as well. And I will keep you um, noticed. Other than that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Ten, nine minutes. Nine minutes. I know, I tried. I tried. Nine minutes. Okay.